Hello and welcome back to CS631 Advanced Programming in the Unix Environment. This is week 13, segment 6, and we're completing our discussion on how to restrict processes by looking at POLIX capabilities, Linux control groups or C groups, and how these and the various other methods we've discussed in the last few videos allow us to build containers like Docker or LXC. As we've seen methods to restrict CPU usage, as well as file system views, memory and process table access, We'll also want to restrict other capabilities, such that we can better contain and control process groups. One approach to define the more generic requirements here are POSIX capabilities. In this model, rather than trying to specifically solve a given problem, as in the case of a restricted shell or a TRUD, we identify the generic capability that a process needs and grant fine-grained access controls over these. For example, the following capabilities may be defined. Capt chown, the ability to chown files. Capt set UID, to allow set UID. Capt Linux immutable, to allow append only or immutable flags we've seen in a previous video. We have a restriction to allow network sockets to bind to a port below 1024, or a restriction to allow interface configuration and routing table manipulation. We have a capability to allow the use of raw packets. And we have more collective capabilities, such as the CAPSIS admin capability that provides broad system administration privileges, such as mounting file system, setting host names, handling swap, etc. As so often, the standard is interpreted and implemented by different operating systems in different ways. For example, on FreeBSD, Capsicum implements a capability and sandbox framework. NetBSD and macOS implement a kernel authorization framework called KAuth, while in Linux systems you can read about this implementation in the Capabilities Manual page. Another way to partition the system and restrict visibility of resources by processes and process groups are Linux namespaces, inspired by Bell Labs' Plan 9 operating system. Using namespaces, one process may view components of the system either differently from, or not at all, than another process group might. These resources may exist in multiple namespaces, which allows for a high degree of flexibility in carving up the system to only expose what's needed to a given process group. The different types of resources made available via namespaces are mount points, process ID visibility, a virtualized network stack, whereby each namespace has its own set of IP addresses, its own routing table, firewall rules, etc. System 5 IPC visibility, semaphores, shared memory and message queue kernel structures. A Unix timesharing namespace allowing for different host and domain names. User namespaces that allow mapping of different user IDs, such that, for example, the root account is mapped to a non-privileged account in a given namespace a namespace to allow different processes to utilize different system times, and finally, so-called control groups. Now these control groups, or C groups, or process containers as they were initially called, allow for isolation of the different resource utilization we've seen. Memory limits, CPU utilization, prioritization, and limits, accounting, that is, keeping track of which processes utilize which resources in what ways, and process control, allowing for suspension, interruption, application checkpointing, and restarting of processes. Cgroups were redesigned at least once, and version 2 now supports the following controls. The ability to schedule tasks, CPU and memory utilization, the activity of control groups themselves, Tasks in a frozen group could then not be scheduled, for example. Large page support and usage, block device I.O., memory, kernel memory and swap memory, the ability to monitor threads, restrictions on the number of processes available, as well as remote directory memory access. C groups are implemented as a virtual file system often using the sysfs cgroup mount point, and thus allowing for enabling of different controllers using mount options. <laughs> 
Here's an example of restricting memory usage of the current shell. Creation of a new C group is trivially done by creating a new directory in the pseudo file system, placing the process ID of the shell into it, and then adding a conveniently human readable restriction. The manual page is actually very detailed and extensive here, and I recommend you take the time to read through it. Now, containers at last are, as the name suggests, a way to contain processes. That is, they provide an isolated execution environment on, and this is the important distinction from full hardware virtualization, the same operating system providing a lightweight approach. In order to contain a process, you might use a null or union mount to provide the right file system here, restrict the processes in their utilization to avoid interference with the parent system or other processes, restrict file system visibility beyond the assigned views, restrict processes from what other processes they can see, and restrict processes from what they can do. Even though we've discussed many ways to apply such restrictions in this context, cgroups and namespaces are frequently discussed together, as they complement each other well. In fact, the combination of cgroups and namespaces forms the basis for many operating system level virtualization and container technologies, such as CoreOS, LXC, or Docker. Consider the basic operating system, with a layered distinction we've used from the beginning of the semester. We have hardware at the bottom, a kernel managing the hardware, a set of system calls as the interface into the kernel, as well as a number of library functions to allow applications to execute within the OS. Now, access to the hardware includes broad access by the kernel, but also means that processes do, by and large, retain the same view of the hardware. The file system, process space, and networking capabilities are the same for each process, even if we can restrict it what each can directly manipulate. In full hardware virtualization, things are a bit different. We still have hardware and the kernel managing it, but then we have a slim OS on top of that. The hypervisor, which virtualizes the hardware and makes it available to each VM. Within the VM, each operating system sees only what the hypervisor makes available, but within each application within that OS it again behaves the same as any process execution on physical hardware. When talking about lightweight OS level virtualization, we then have a different situation. That is, we start out again with the basic view we're familiar with. But we can now apply the various lessons from this series of videos and, for example, use a restricted shell in combination with certain mount options and a fixed CPU priority as well as some file attributes to craft a restricted view of the file system and restrict process execution capabilities. Or we can use a jail in conjunction with CPU sets and ACLs to restrict the process, file system, and network view of certain processes or we can create a per-process or per-process group restricted environment consisting of finely tuned namespaces, C groups, and resource limits. And that is really all containers are, processes running on our general purpose Unix operating system that we have restricted such that they can't see or access all the resources, that they are contained to only the views we allow. Note, however, that unlike with full hardware virtualization, containers are still processes or process groups. That is, they are still running on the same kernel as the host or parent. This is both an advantage. Instantiation of the virtual environment is much faster than, for example, booting a virtual machine. But also has limitations. You can only run a container of the given OS, not another OS. Well, that sums up our tour of all the various ways of restricting processes, the techniques and technologies that lead up to the ever-popular containers. There are many other related approaches, and we only have just scratched the surface, but I hope that you've at least seen that there is no magic. Everything we've covered in this semester so far should enable you to better understand, say, Docker and friends. Perhaps the most important lessons to draw here are that most process restrictions can be circumvented in some way, and that the goal is to voluntarily restrict yourself such that a compromise cannot gain an attacker elevated privileges that you may have held previously. Understanding Unix processes and base semantics are critical in setting up and configuring such restricted environments. That 
and that we've actually come a pretty long way from our first lecture. Perhaps go back and revisit some of the topics now with an eye towards these concepts. Either way, thanks for watching, and until next time. Cheers!